smartphones. We love talking about them, we love reviewing them, we love them. But we don't always talk about the network architecture required to support these devices, particularly in times of calamity, natural disaster, terrorist attack, or what have you. Well, today, in Hartford, Connecticut, we're going to show you a little bit about how a national carrier prepares for those situations. I'm Michael Fisher, this is Pocket Now, and this is your guided tour of the AT&T Disaster Recovery Team. So imagine you're in the middle of a hurricane and your cell phone service fails. Or you're trying to get in touch with family in a disaster area and can't get through. Being out of touch is a scary thing in our ultra-connected world. It can be expensive for businesses and dangerous for those inside disaster areas. That's why AT&T formed the Network Disaster Recovery Team, which was first fully deployed 13 years ago in the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks. The team's mission? to get you reconnected as quickly as possible following an event that damages the network. In a worst case scenario, the disaster recovery team can replicate the functionality of an entire disabled or destroyed central office. To do this takes a lot of hardware. The large scale NDR exercise we're visiting in Hartford involves about 30 pieces of major equipment out of about 320 available nationally and between 70 to 80 personnel on the ground. The hardware comes in from undisclosed locations strategically placed around the country, and the people from within AT&T's workforce, all of them having volunteered for disaster recovery duty. This is a broad look at how the carrier gets communications up and running after a major disaster. The first AT&T vehicle to arrive on site after a calamity is often the ECV, or Emergency Communications Vehicle. The ECV is topped by a satellite antenna for backhaul, and it can use that connection to produce its own Wi-Fi hotspots or even a microcell for cellular communication. Because of the limited bandwidth of the satellite connection, it won't replace an entire central office on its own, but it can help first responders stay connected with one another. Five of these ECVs were set up in the impacted area after Hurricane Sandy, providing temporary internet access to responders and victims. This one supports the administrative needs of the entire 70 to 80 person camp here at Hartford. Running that camp is a bigger job, which calls for a bigger trailer. The operations trailer serves as the command and control center for the entire encampment. Here, the people coordinating disaster recovery can allocate personnel depending on what work needs to get done. Using microwave, satellite, or even older HF radio technology, the ops trailer coordinates with the AT&T Global Network Operations Center in New Jersey to ensure that the NDR team is working on the most critical elements of a damaged network. The operation is conducted in accordance with the National Incident Management System, providing a consistent experience between AT&T personnel and first responders. Actually, restoring those communications takes specialized equipment, depending on what's been knocked offline. If cellular base stations, better known as towers, are down, AT&T can call on its fleet of sat colts. Within a few hours of arriving at a disaster area, two or three NDR team members can activate this cell site on a light truck to replace damaged or destroyed cellular towers, blanketing an area in 3G connectivity for AT&T customers. T-Mobile customers can also connect for emergency calls or other calls in extreme circumstances, but because this is an HSPA-only vehicle, Verizon and Sprint customers need to rely on their own carrier's emergency preparedness. Wireless service isn't all that AT&T provides, of course, and it's not all the NDR team focuses on either. Replacing a disabled central office also requires restoring landline data connectivity, and that's where the IP trailers come in. The two we toured in Hartford operate on different hardware due to AT&T's network architecture, but they both do the same job. Replace damaged network connections so the carrier subscribers in and around affected areas can communicate again. To do all this takes a lot of power. While most everything in the NDR camp runs on big batteries for continuity of service, those batteries are charged by a variety of means. If electrical power is still available inside the disaster area, the team can plug in using its power distribution trailer to convert and parcel out that electricity. If not, this NDR team can call on a 600 kilowatt diesel generator and or two 375 kilowatt units with fuel provided by vendors based on prearranged contracts. There's even a trailer for logistical support kind of a hardware store for the entire NDR camp. Everything from lubricating oil to batteries to bug spray is housed here, alongside a machine shop for quick fabrication of simple parts. Sometimes a network's equipment isn't destroyed, but instead rendered hazardous to humans. 
This happened in Graniteville, South Carolina, during a train derailment in 2005, when chlorine gas rendered AT&T's central office uninhabitable. NDR team members suited up and performed repairs and maintenance of the equipment. The team members can also use devices like these to measure atmospheric contamination from everything from common gases to radioactive elements and act accordingly. We've only scratched the surface of the NDR team's capabilities. Considering its long history and the over $600 million invested in it, maybe that's unsurprising. The sense that I got from talking to everyone involved is that AT&T takes disaster recovery very seriously. The people working on and with the NDR team are committed to getting customers reconnected as quickly as possible after a major event, using the many means at their disposal. Remember, they're all volunteers. As this video hits the feeds, three members of the team that were training in Hartford are now in Oklahoma, working to restore network connectivity so victims of the tornado strike can stay in touch and so emergency responders can better communicate. Sometimes all the comfort in the world can come in the form of a simple phone call or text message, and AT&T seems to understand that very well. For more from Pocket Now, follow us on our social feeds and subscribe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.